Welcome back to this latest episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Story, President Dale Gunning, Tokyo Training Japan. And my special guest today is Marco Breifeld, who is the Representative Director for Draga Japan. Marco, welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and you mentioned you, you've joined about, what, six months ago? Yeah, just six months ago. Wow, Quite so you're just getting in right into it now. How is it you're here in Japan running a foreign organization? Can you give us a bit of the backstory on how you're... Korea has brought you to Japan. This is a very long story. I have to okay, say. all right. So I think you started in Japan in 1980s, yeah. So yeah, I came here first time was 79. 79. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And so so my first time in Japan was 1996. Okay. I visited some friends here, and I liked the country very much. Uh, and so I found a way to study international management and Japanese culture and language. Uh, what, and this is back in Germany? That's in Germany. Was, right. it easy, was it easy to find places to study Japanese culture and business in those days? No, at that point of time to have this mix because like everybody is studying economics and yes. I wanted to have my, yes. let's say, my setting point, my unique setting point. And Japanese I thought could be my unique setting point. I was right at the end. So, and there were just two places in Germany with this mixed uh, course where you could uh, study economics and Japanese uh, the same way. It's still existing in Bremen. Mm, okay. Well, well done. And so you, you graduate in your degree, and then what happens then? So, um, basically, uh, during university, what I want to uh, tell you is I lived for one year in Japan. Oh. So, because this course of study says uh, not only that you need to speak fluent Japanese, but uh, you have to stay in the country for one year. Um, some people were more at a university studying, and for me, I'm more a practical person. So I worked at uh, Westerbe, so Nishida to Shoken. It's not existing anymore, but uh, I tried to, I thought about maybe doing something in the direction of asset management later on uh, for half a year in Tokyo and half a year in the uh, city hall of Takaokashi in toyama -ken. Oh, toyama -ken. that's very Inaka, that's very countryside. Yeah, and it was very helpful to learn Japanese because there was nobody speaking any English. <laughs> and so at, the, at this uh, city hall, I was going through different departments, I was also giving German and English lessons, but I learned about uh, how the bureaucracy is working in Japan, which was very helpful. Mm -hmm. And so this year must have gone very quickly. So you go back to Germany to complete the degree. And then I started uh, at uh, Honda Motor Europe North in, in Germany first. So at that point of time, Honda was uh, selling much more cars uh, than now in Europe, especially in Germany. And uh, Honda Motor North was also responsible for Austria, Belgium, Netherlands. And I was doing reporting and controlling First for Netherlands and Belgium, and the end I was doing also Germany in consolidation. And uh, I learned how it is to work at a Japanese company in Europe, which is also quite quite important. Was the uh, were the executives running the show in Germany coming from Japan, or were they local German executives? Um, for the legal part, so the, the managing director was German, but basically president, vice president, so on, everybody Japanese. Oh, okay. So that must be interesting. Here's your first occasion. I mean, you live in Japan, you work in a company, but when you're actually, you know, under that Japanese system and you're not coming from that system, it's like, well, okay, this is quite different. What, what things did you notice that they were doing that was different? Um, so at that point of time, it's 20 years ago already, mm -hmm. um, at, at Honda Motor North, it was quite hierarchical. So, mm -hmm. uh, so president was quite quite something, yeah? yeah. so people you don't see every, every day and uh, also quite quite strict and not very flexible. Mm -hmm. I think also Honda changed within the last uh, 20 years, yeah? mm -hmm. but at that point of time it was quite, quite uh, strict, a uh, bit tight. Mm -hmm. On the other side, for Honda, uh, I liked the, the Honda way of doing things. Yeah? Mm -hmm. For example, uh, Gemba, that you have to go to the place where the action happens. Yeah, mm -hmm. so this is something which I found out during my career. This is very helpful mm -hmm. because at the end, when you 
uh, just here, yeah, you have now all this uh, video conference and so on, mm -hmm. and this saves a lot of money. Yeah, you don't have to go to to travel around the world for everything. Yeah, uh, but uh, if uh, there's really a problem, if it's a technical problem, if it's something where you have to see the place, it's not good enough to have somebody with a video cam to go around. Yeah. It's to go to the place, to talk to the people, yeah. and, and then to find out what is the root cause. Yes. And that's something I learned at Honda also. Mm. And uh, what did you notice about the management? I mean, you, was it, you said it was quite tight, so it was a type of micromanagement, or what were they using there? No, no, no. It was not so much micromanagement. It was more top down. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, at the end, on the, let's say, European level, uh, it was condensed and then brought, uh, brought to, to president, vice president level. Uh, this was the, the usual way. Mm -hmm. So, something uh, once I was doing, uh, so basically, next to controlling and, uh, and reporting, I was also in, in different working groups additionally. And uh, one working group was at that point of time already the first Korean car companies were getting more market share in, in Germany mm -hmm. or in Europe. And uh, was, uh, we're doing uh, uh, case studies about the Koreans. And, uh, and I thought after getting some of the results, it's already at the point of time, wow, they're convincing, quality is going up uh, for, for the customers, they are getting recognized with a better image and so on. And uh, something I was surprised about it, that at that point of time, uh, the, the upper management said, oh, Koreans uh, can, can buy, uh, can't uh, create nice cars, yeah? They will not get high market share. Now in Europe, uh, the Koreans have as much market share as yeah, Japanese makers, and mm -hmm. Honda, by the way, unfortunately, is not doing that well. Mm -hmm. But that was something that they were not, not good at listening, maybe. Yeah? Mm -hmm. On the also other the pride too, you know, we're, we're making cars in Japan, it's such a high quality, no one can match that. Yeah, yeah, maybe it could be, yeah, mm -hmm. for, but uh, on the other side, the company was already quite advanced. If you're thinking about, we have, for example, we had like an internal working groups regarding internal marketing because we wanted, uh, there were more than 500 employees at Honda at the point of time, uh, motorcycles, Europe number one. Uh, everything uh, and on PE equipment, power equipment, yeah. Um, so everything else except the Honda jet was already there. Um, and so these guys, uh, um, they, it was as an employee for power equipment, you do, didn't know nothing about the cars and so on. And we were at an internal working group, we were making it more prominent and that everybody gets, as an employee, a fan of the company, which is quite important that you see uh, people are maybe, uh, or of course, people are more motivated if they see a cause and if they want to uh, have a good feeling about what they're doing, also the company. And that's the reason why we spread around new, new products, for example. We made, uh, we had the designer of the new CRV at that point of time and uh, giving speech about why he's doing it that way before the launch, way before the launch. Yeah? And uh, so that was that was quite nice. If I uh, if I had gone with you to work at that time, and uh, presumably drove to the uh, the factory or the office or whatever, would I have seen only Honda cars in the car park, or would it have been a big mixture of things? Mostly, mostly I think mostly Honda cars, mm -hmm. but it was also because there was a nice, a, a quite attractive uh, lease. Um, so, so you could lease cars for, for a quite attractive price. Uh, and they had nice cars at that point of time. The S2000 was out. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I was more into sports cars. So NSX was too expensive for leasing, of course, yeah. But uh, um, they were quite nice, attractive cars. And so most people were driving Honda cars, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, because I used to work for Ford on the assembly line when I was younger. And there's a whole variety of cars in the car park. That idea of, you know, we only, like in Japan, we work for Honda, we only drive Honda, we only have Honda in the car park. It didn't exist on those days. But anyway, so what happens? Uh, how long are you in Honda? Six and a half years. Six and a half years, okay. And so are you managing a team inside Honda in Germany at that time? No, it was just after university. So right. basically I was uh, kind of consulting for the, for the local accounting. 
So there was local accounting also in the countries, mm -hmm. and I was the one who was consolidating uh, during the monthly closing and so on, and implementing new tools, new SAP tools and so on. And I was going there from time to time and uh, teaching them about uh, new rules, new guidelines, about new tools, and uh, basically what they need to do their job good, but I was not their supervisor. I was right. just a kind of consultant. Right. So after the six years there, what happens then? Um, honestly speaking, uh, I met my wife. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, and uh, she was also at Honda and had to go back. She was an expat and had to go back to headquarters. And uh, for me, time at Honda was nice, but uh, let's say, the, I wanted to see something new. I wanted to also enhance myself, mm -hmm. uh, and so I moved to to live in Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, lived in Japan. Now I'm already here for 18 years. Mm -hmm. I think the the biggest uh, lesson, or, or as a career step, I was uh, uh, first time a manager when I worked for for Planze. Planze is a uh, Austrian company uh, around three billion euro turnover who is uh, uh, concentrating on precious metals and uh, molybdenum, tungsten and so on. So are they, are they a... Uh, they produce. They produce, they're, they're doing, they're not just mining, they're actually producing precious metals into items or something. Right, 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 right. right. So right. And you could manufacturer, see... Manufacturer, basically. Manufacturer, manufacturing right. and, and services also. Right. And uh, so Japan also has a strong foothold because of production, let's say, screens, uh, collimators for x-ray, right. whatever, so every semiconductor industry mm -hmm. and uh, so I started there uh, as a manager in 2010, accounting first, then also accounting and administration and after half a year then uh, moved on this change to business units. I was also responsible as a controller from a controlling perspective for a worldwide business unit, Semicon with factories in uh, US, uh, Japan and India, later on a bit also in Korea. And this was also a, a, first a nice career, uh, career step for me. And also... So this is your first time to lead a team? Yeah, yeah. Either yeah. in Europe or in Japan, right? So yeah, actually you're, yeah. a, you're a Correct. person who is a, you know, had a function in Germany, now you're actually going to lead a team. How, how many people in the team when you first started? Um, County administration, six people. Yeah. Six people, right? Yeah. So, what was that like? What was challenging to lead a team of Japanese working here? Uh, first, generally, to lead a team wherever country, yeah, you have different characters, different people. So, uh, basically, um, in general, it, it's first about to see uh, how they're doing things, uh, like in the first two or three weeks, to tell them what they have to do better makes not much sense because you don't know what they are doing. Mm -hmm. So first you have to learn what they are doing and why they are doing that way mm -hmm. and then to find ways uh, how they can make it better, if mm -hmm. there are better ways. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so the first one, two months was, was more about learning. Mm -hmm. um, also I went to, to head office in Austria mm -hmm. um, and uh, then it was about introducing, uh, let's say, measures to that they can do their job better mm -hmm. in the one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, at that point of time, I think overtime was a big topic uh, in the first months that could be reduced significantly also because sometimes they were not doing things efficiently. So is this overtime, there's a couple of reasons for overtime, you know, one is uh, Japanese take 10 hours to do an 8 hour job, the pace of work is one thing, the other is Japanese, I think, in many companies have discovered the way to make more money is to work overtime. So even if the overtime is not warranted, we'll work the overtime, we can actually make more dough. So which was it? Was it a case of the pace of work, over too much quantity of work, or is it a make more money idea? I think some of the work was really not necessary, mm -hmm. but they did this uh, work anyway because maybe nobody told them not to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also because it's always always there, so it can be here, and I just do it like all, all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. to to question uh, if this is necessary, and in the same quality and quantity, 
that was my job then, mm -hmm. or maybe to do it in a different way. Mm -hmm. So, but for that first, I had to learn what they do in detail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What other things did you notice when you first started leading the team? Um, I, I think the, that uh, there are always some some more difficult characters and some more, more some characters which are easier to deal with. Mm -hmm. And for the more difficult characters, it's always a way, you need to find a way to bring them on board. Mm -hmm. Because if they are quietly quitting, as mm -hmm. is said right now, uh, then it's not much help for the team. Mm -hmm. So to, to have more one-on-ones at least at the beginning and, and to talk about their motivation, uh, what is their, their, their Yaruki switch. The, mm -hmm. that's a, what, what switch, we want. switch for them, yeah. Yeah, this is this is quite important to find out. And often, you know, we we find that in a team we got a mixture of people, and there'll be some people who are a bit like us, our personality style, and we'll find it easy to talk to them. But then there are other people who are not like our personality style, and it's quite hard to to get on their wavelength, you know. So uh, you were talking about just spending time with them to try and understand them better. How long did it take you to actually start to get in that process of really start to understand who they were? Several months, maybe. maybe Not deep, quick, isn't it? De mm. de depending on the person after half a year. Mm. And sometimes there were ridiculous points like uh, there was a new employee agreement and for most of people, or for nearly everybody, it was a better deal. But one person, just because of the sake of it, he was not signing it because he was not informed properly. Uh, and so there was long discussions with him about why he doesn't want to sign and, and so on. So, yeah, also, it takes some time for me to, to learn about it, yeah, mm -hmm. how to do things and how to bring people on board. Mm -hmm. And eventually you got there. So, uh, you also got bigger responsibility, I think, when you were there. And did your team size grow? Yes, so basically, uh, then first was just accounting, then was just also administration, and then also, uh, at, at least on a dotted line, I was also responsible for, for the accounting um, stuff in, uh, in the US and also partly in India and in mm -hmm. Korea. So, and also some traveling necessary, but uh, here also totally different characters again. Yeah. Mm. So as your as the scale increases, I guess you're still they're still uh, in your team. For example, if it gets big enough, then you're going to have section heads within your team who will take care of the people, and you sort of take care of the section heads. Did it get that big, or you're still pretty direct control? That happened just at the next place. Next place, okay. Yeah. So let's go back before we get to that. As the scale increased, and as you also you got people in different time zones. You know, which is not so easy to, to communicate with if they're in Europe or the States, you know, reporting to you as well. What were some of the challenges when the scale got bigger in terms of leading people? It was not easy to go to Gamba, for example, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's not like I have a problem, uh, oh, I fly to California tomorrow, it's not possible. Yeah. Uh, so you have to, uh, you need to trust people. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then also, of course, the team is important, uh, that, that you have the right, right team, that we have persons that uh, if they tell you something, you can believe what they are saying. Mm -hmm. This is quite, uh, quite essential, but it's something you should not forget about. Mm -hmm. And then how long have you been um, At Plansy, five and a half years. Five and a half, right. right. So and then where do you go? Yeah, first, first, one thing I wanted to mention, because yeah, sure. this is important. Uh, so uh, I was uh, at Plansee in 2011, mm -hmm. when the big earthquake mm -hmm. uh, and the tsunami hit. Mm -hmm. And uh, Plansee has and still has, had and still has a collection in Iwatake. Mm -hmm. And one striking thing about uh, Japan and Japanese uh, in a positive way is um, this place was hit hard. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So. Um, and the, the people around, they had also their, their own problems. Uh, some, some people uh, um, had, uh, had flood, uh, so their houses uh, was, was flooded and mm -hmm. some people lo lost even family members. Mm -hmm. But even if they had their, their own problem, even if there was no like, electricity, uh, which is also a, a tough thing uh, mm -hmm. in modern economy, um, 
we had the problem that uh, this were uh, precision machines that are creating products for the uh, for the semiconductor industry, um, for example, for Taiwan. Taiwan doesn't care at all if there was a flood in, in a production facility or not. They say next week Wednesday these products have to be there, or our production stops, and you have to pay for it. So at the end, uh, what was happening is that. Our employees, even having their own problems, uh, went at the weekend. Friday was, was this big earthquake war and the, the tsunami. Went at the weekend to the factory, cleaning up, uh, changing the machines, moving it, uh, and trying to, to bring them near to start when, uh, when the electricity comes back that they can start working again. And even uh, some employees, because it was, uh, I think, you no know, FedEx and so on was running because some of the highways were were, uh, <coughs> were not intact. So there were employees for this customer in uh, in Taiwan. They were taking their own uh, their own uh, car, the private car, I don't know, high or something, going to the factory, getting our products into the car. Driving to the next uh, next uh, airport, it was Akte or somewhere, so very far away. Quite far. Bring it, in, bring it there, and <laughs> ship it then to Taiwan, that the customer gets their product in time. And for me, this was I said, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, and honestly speaking, I wouldn't see anybody in Germany or most people of Germany wouldn't do this. But in Japan, mm -hmm. this commitment mm -hmm. to the company, mm -hmm. to their work. Is quite high, mm. so that's that's something that was striking for me when I mm. when I worked for Plan Z. Yeah, and that's I mean particularly you know, Tohoku got hit very hard, lots of people dead, lots of people missing, nuclear meltdown, triple nuclear meltdown. I mean it's horrendous, and so yeah, incredible that they are so dedicated, even beyond all their own personal and family issues. They're still we've got to get it out. I'm a bit unhappy about the Taiwanese company not being a bit more understanding too, you know, but anyway, that's a separate business issue, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so then what happens after, after the plan C? So, company? basically, then the next big, uh, big career step came with, uh, I uh, moved then uh, to Piro, Japan, which is a, uh, was, a, was a German company at that point of time and a wine importer with a multi-channel business. So. Basic Pirot, uh, what they're still doing right now is they have B2B and B2C business, uh, wine bars, uh, restaurant business, uh, direct selling business, uh, internet business. And I was uh, uh, hired there as a CFO and also as one of two representative directors. And uh, basically most of back office uh, was uh, then uh, under my hood. And so this was, was a big career step for me also. How many people are we talking about now? 60. 60, right? So you've gone quite a big scale jump up to 60. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, was, what was the adjustment you had to make now to run a team of 60 in Japan? Um, I s less and less, it was micromanagement is not possible, basically. You can, uh, if you have a topic which is really burning, from time to time, sometimes you have to go into the details, but mostly it's about having a trust relationship with your manager, mm -hmm. uh, so to your direct subordinates, and to, to trust that they would tell you the, the truth and that you can make a decision based on uh, this information. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, this, this was also a big change, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what else was challenging apart from that? Um, there were some areas which were new for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Logistics, for example, was mm -hmm. the first time. And uh, it was a quite, quite a big uh, uh, warehouse mm -hmm. in Yokohama. And uh, also, of course, uh, this is B2C business. And it's not let's say, as relaxed regarding delivery times, uh, because mm -hmm. in times of Amazon, everybody wants their, mm -hmm. their products. Mm -hmm. Very fast, mm -hmm. even with something that's not very essential. Mm -hmm. um, so to to uh, first the first thing is uh, then different uh, kind of commitment uh, to B two C customers, mm -hmm. different level of commitment, and uh, also it was just that uh, COVID started at that point of time, and uh, 
So some of the business was not possible the same way it was possible before. For example, uh, Pirot uh, was and is known for doing a lot of events. Yeah, mm -hmm. nice events at, at nice places mm -hmm. where people gather, drinking nice wine. Yeah, um, but during COVID. Uh, most of these uh, events couldn't happen, or mm -hmm. just on a much lower scale, especially mm -hmm. in 2020, in the first mm -hmm. uh, of 2021. Um, and that meant uh, that uh, potential income was lost, uh, also this was used to uh, create new customers, these new customers were not coming. Mm -hmm. So um, you also had to find way, other ways to First, to create new customers, mm -hmm. and second, uh, to to save costs. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, cost saving was very essential at that point of time. So you had to look really sometimes, sometimes into details about your P and L and look at which are the areas where we can save more costs. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know about when I started, but when COVID hit, uh, that was the thing to do. Yeah. No, well, Pierroth has been in Japan a long time. When I got here in '79, I remember Pierroth doing wine tastings and this type right, of thing right, right, back right, then. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. they've been here a long, long time. And so, um, how how did you uh, you finish there as a CFO, and then you spent how many years there? Two and a half years. Basically, the company in Japan, uh, the operations were sold uh, ah. uh, last year. Okay. Uh, to a, a Japanese uh, venture capital mm -hmm. company. Um, so, Pirot in, in Germany, they found, uh, so they, they closed some, some businesses uh, worldwide uh, because they made loss. Not Japan operation, Japan operation was very profitable, mm -hmm. but at the end, Japan, pro, uh, Japan business was 40% of the total group turnover. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just too big, uh, mm -hmm. and it was like like the uh, the dog and the tail, yeah. But, right. but mm -hmm. uh, at the end, uh, um, it was not no way to 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 satisfy the needs of the Japanese company, also regarding uh, capex and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, and to be able to to grow more and to change the business because it was more. In an old way, we were not, uh, Pirot was not that big in, in the internet business yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and not to lose more ground, you need mm -hmm. uh, uh, capital. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, what uh, this new owner was giving us mm -hmm. to, to move on and to, to change the company, to make it mm -hmm. a, a company which will also survive the next 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, so I was basically leading the sale of the company and oh, uh, okay. uh, all this uh, due diligence and mm -hmm. so on, which was, uh, it hurt myself also because I felt like I wanted to work for a German company, that's the reason why I started there. Mm -hmm. And with selling the company, basically I cut more or less uh, the line to Germany. Mm -hmm. And after some time, then also the uh, the manager and director, the other representative director, he, uh, the French person, he moved on and there was a Japanese person coming in uh, and he had a different management style. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, I spoke only Japanese, which was not bad in one way. On the other side, I have no international contact anymore. Mm -hmm. So, and basically that's one of my selling points mm -hmm. and one of the reasons why I'm here, because mm -hmm. I can be the bridge person between mm -hmm. Yeah. Japan and Germany were a foreign country, and I couldn't, I didn't have this uh, function anymore, and that was the reason why I, I moved then uh, here to Dragon. Here to Dragon, you've been here six months. So, when you make a change like that, you come in and say, How long has Dragon been in Japan? More than 40 years. 40 years, right? So, well established business, teams have been here probably a long time, a lot of long term people here. What was your thinking about, okay, how am I going to approach this? How am I going to come in here and take over? What was your thinking? Um, so the, the question was, what, what was what was also, uh, so the people who were hiring me, what was their expectation? Mm. And uh, I think there was the expectation for uh, more stability and uh, for uh, for more trust, transparency 
maybe also on both ways. Transparency mm. for German head office mm. and, and also AAA head office in Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other side, here in Japan, uh, sometimes the communication was not good. Uh, I don't know which, which fault in it, but, but at the end, uh, communication between the Japanese stuff and, and Germany was not as it could be. Mm -hmm. So Germany was asked, why, why can't you do this? And they maybe were not satisfied with the answer or didn't get the answer to do something about it. On mm -hmm. the other side, Japan said, why is Germany, Germany doing something? And we cannot understand this. Mm -hmm. So this was one, one big topic, I think. Mm -hmm. So transparency uh, and to, to bring shed more light on the other side also to uh, so Drega, Japan, uh, so turnover here is uh, around 80% medical, about 20% safety. We want to grow both businesses, of course. And uh, for the medical business, of course, uh, here the biggest change, challenge is uh, that we want to uh, move from just being a company that is in Japan more selling devices mm -hmm. to a solution provider. Uh, okay. Starting from uh, designing emergency in the operation rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see it in the background, by yeah, the way. I see one behind me there. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, and then designing it, uh, uh, providing all solutions, mm -hmm. so all the devices, the IT, mm -hmm. uh, next to also later on being maintenance, they be uh, consumables and so on. So be the one box provider that mm -hmm. the customer can trust to do everything. And that's still a long way, but, but we are on the way. Right. If you want to be successful as a leader, do the Leadership Training for Managers course. All companies need people who can both manage and lead. Leading people screams out for real skills in communication, dealing with all different types of people, being excellent at innovation, planning, delegation, handling mistakes, doing performance reviews really well, and inspiring and motivating the team. Do the Leadership Training for Managers course now in either Japanese or English. Are you doing business with Japan? Do you really know how things work? Japan Business Mastery provides the answers. Do you have the right networks and know how to create them? Do you know how to get on the same wavelength with Japanese buyers? Do you know what being trustworthy looks like from the Japanese perspective? Japan Business Mastery is based on more than 30 years experience in Japan and will become your go-to guide. Want to succeed in Japan? Buy Japan Business Mastery now. So if you think back in your career in Japan, leading teams here, what things have you found worked well to get people engaged? And I, I love that story about the team in you know, Tohoku going to the plan, cleaning it up, getting this stuff done, driving to Akita, which is not close, getting it on the plane so the client doesn't miss out. That's phenomenal engagement. But what other things have you found worked well to get engagement in a Japanese team? Um, so first, I'm always seen as a foreigner. I look as, like a foreigner, yeah? Uh, even if, I think my Japanese is not bad. Um, I might even have no accent and maybe my, my Kegel is not as good as uh, of native Japanese, yeah? Um, so I would never be as good in Japanese as uh, native Japanese are. Um, so I have to show also uh, first that even if the culture is different, um, that I can be of help for them, um, mm -hmm. that uh, if they have problems, they can come to me and we can discuss and I can be helpful to them to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, for me, it's good then that I can uh, have transparency about what is coming up, uh, maybe get a heads up about something um, and I can do something about it and are fully aware of it before something maybe worse happens. Mm -hmm. So, so to create this trust relationship, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's especially at the beginning, one-in-one uh, -one, uh, meetings are important, and uh, to to show that you care, that you really uh, do want to know about the problem, you want to help. Uh, this is uh, very important. 
did you get involved in, you know, lunches, dinners, drinking outside of the office, that type of... We probably don't do that much anymore because of COVID, but we were doing it at some point. Was that part of the function of getting people engaged or not? Yes. So, um, compared to, uh, let's say, far before COVID, 2015, 16, 17 and so on, I think it's much less mm -hmm. because of COVID, but also because people are maybe more cost-cautious about mm -hmm. this. Yeah? And uh, also, again, uh, when customers, uh, clients are uh, also involved, uh, medical industry is quite restricted, uh, mm -hmm. so you have your rules and uh, which we have to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, uh, it's, it's important, this communication still works, mm -hmm. so that people uh, sometimes uh, open up to uh, if you drink uh, a beer or two with them. Mm -hmm. But it's not like uh, uh, you can do this every day, yeah? mm -hmm. maybe we do this uh, every two weeks once or so with different groups, but that's mm -hmm. it. And I think you said you've got a couple hundred people in this building yeah. and you've got more people in other parts of the organization in Japan. So altogether, how many people? Uh, so here, here in Miguel Office, there are around 100 people. 100, okay. 200, 215, I think, are Seishine and then we have some also some, some temporary in Kyokshine, so 230 people altogether. 230, it's quite a big number. So how do you get 230 people engaged? You know, how does it work? I think it would be difficult to to, uh, to have everybody fully engaged all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, partly it's the character, partly it's also how the team is team is working, mm -hmm. but it's to uh, get them everybody more engaged in their way. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think one point is to uh, I think Draeger is a good example where you can say. It has a, it's a company with a cause, yeah? uh, with, mm -hmm. with a reason why why Strong the company why. wants to exist. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, so this is why uh, to to save people's life. And mm -hmm. if you can do some improvements on mm -hmm. this device, for example, it mm -hmm. can save more lives. Mm -hmm. That's quite motivating, yes. I think. Yeah, yes. and if you can see this and if you can make this visible. Um, this is uh, of course uh, it's a motivator. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's it's incentives yeah to put mm -hmm. the incentives right mm -hmm. uh, that they they get uh, their bonus uh, to put the right incentives but the incentives also uh, I think something which uh, every company has also Träger is that you have a kind of uh, that I my incentives and that is apart from the incentives so uh, I think it's important partly communication partly also, cross-department cross projects where people come together and do workshop about problems that are not only regarding one department but which uh, a lot of people care about because it's uh, about the whole company and then you have uh, from different departments people who come together and even if it's not their incentive for the bonus uh, they, we find play, we find a reason to solve this problem, and then people are getting engaged because they see, ah, this person has the same problem, even if it's from a totally different department, to and he can understand better why he also has this problem from a different angle. So to uh, make people understand each other is also can be a good motivator. Often I talk to foreign uh, CEOs here and uh, regarding the, particularly the sales teams because most non-sales teams are getting a bonus and it's often a type of delayed payment you know they're actually um, getting a winter and summer bonus as actually part of their salary it gets as opposed to something which is actually based on merit or effectiveness or productivity right so there's a little bit of a difference in what a bonus is but in the case of salespeople, when the salespeople are not performing the foreign CEO thinks Okay, we'll give them more incentive through money. But often they tell me, it didn't work. You know, we, I offered them you know, X, Y, Z, and it made no difference whatsoever. So what have you found when you talked about incentives before? What sort of incentives did you find work well? Of, of course, the usual incentives are based on uh, net sales, maybe gross profit, uh, and, and so on. Um, so, but... Uh, I think when you're talking about sales, you have the, the let's say it's the salesperson, and then we have here already a first 
management layer. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And for the management layer, uh, it should not only, not only be sales. Uh, so mm -hmm. it uh, should also be about... Uh, uh, so for sales, you could say, is it overall sales? Mm -hmm. Or like, uh, like for Draeger right now, you want to go into uh, uh, a certain direction. Mm -hmm. And then it's not only the total package, it's also about which products and mm -hmm. how to go forward. Mm -hmm. So uh, here, and here it's not only about the, the bonus, it's also about showing that this is necessary for the future of the company. Mm -hmm. yeah, because uh, and I think you know Simon Sinek yeah, mm -hmm. about uh, this, uh, this infinite game. Mm -hmm. And uh, business is an infinite game, so we're not talking about, and, and Drega also doesn't look so much about the next quarter, mm -hmm. it's about uh, will the company still be as big or even existing in 10, 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. and you're always challenged to, to make this possible, mm -hmm. and for the long term view, and uh, if people are here, even if they're here for 5 or 10 years, uh, mm -hmm. Japanese tend to stay in the company for a long time. Mm -hmm. If they want to stay another 20, 10, 20 years, then uh, the company still needs to exist and, mm -hmm. if possible, even growing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, so you may have to show them that it's important that uh, to grow this kind of products is helpful to, uh, as a first seed to, to grow the company in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in terms of uh, if people are engaged, they care. You know, they're going to drive to Iwate and put that, or Agata, wherever it was, and put that stuff on the plane, right? Um, it generally is the first stage to getting innovation. You've got to have that engagement. Because if people are engaged, they care. And if they care, they're going to try and make things improve. Now, you've got usually very specialised people, scientists in R&D labs, doing sort of uh, innovation work there. I'm not talking about that so much. I'm talking about just general innovation, how to make things work faster, better, smoother, cheaper, that, that type of thing. New ideas. What have we found has worked well to get ideas out of a Japanese team? Um, I think you're talking more about operational efficiency, maybe. Yeah? Probably, yeah. yeah. Well, just the general speak of just getting ideas, you know, getting, because often <clears throat> if the brainstorming isn't being done, uh, the ideas stay inside their minds and don't go anywhere. Or if the brainstorming is being done and being done badly, the ideas stay inside their minds and nothing ever changes, you know. But there's often a lot of inside experience perspective inside there which never gets out. So how do we release that? How do we, well, what have you found to release the innovation creative side of your Japanese teams? That's also to, to show them that uh, it's okay to maybe try something out that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe at the beginning not on a big scale, scale mm -hmm. but on a small scale. Mm -hmm. But uh, to give them the freedom to try these things out mm -hmm. and uh, also to, to support them in this way. Mm -hmm. um, not to say uh, uh, you can't do any mistakes, but to, to allow mistakes uh, if, it, uh, if the intention is to do something better. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, uh, here, uh, especially at, uh, at the back office, you have it often that uh, people stick to the stuff they're doing all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and here also, uh, this op operational efficiency or this uh, getting uh, people to, to do something better mm -hmm. um, starts with this thinking. And then if you get uh, then this, this input, may it be an international workshop and country A says, ah, in our country, it looks like uh, we do it this, this way, and somebody ah, very helpful. Can you can you bring mm -hmm. this to me also? Yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, something starts, and you can can evolve and mm -hmm. uh, and have a better, having a better process, or even if it's not necessary, scrap the process at all mm -hmm. and uh, and do it in a different, totally different way. Mm -hmm. So I, I think as once is is have this openness, and then there needs to be this initial. Uh, small flame coming mm -hmm. uh, and that can spread them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You talked about uh, mistakes, right? Because the innovation process is a messy process. It doesn't go perfectly, of course. One of the problems, though, in Japan is that often companies don't tolerate mistakes. You know, it's a zero defect environment. You can't have the, we were a CFO before, right? You can't have the CFO saying, well, look, um, We'll go for a 3% defect rate in Japan because we'll make this much profit 
If we go for a zero defect rate, we'll only make this much profit, so we'll tolerate the 3%. Well, the clients don't tolerate it. The staff don't like it. So from a Western perspective, it's more economically viable to have the toration of the defect, but Carl Trian in Japan, that's unthinkable, there'd be a defect. So this sort of very strong passion to not make mistakes, not have errors, in some ways, Ted, I wonder if that's a, a thing that's blocking creativity and innovation, experimenting, trying. So how did you get around that, that fear of making a mistake? First, uh, speaking about the medical industry, uh, so we have we have to go for hundred percent quality. Yeah. Um, if if not, this would endanger lives. Mm -hmm. So so that's something that of course uh, uh, we are striving for. And uh, um, so, but uh, if you are um, talking about uh, let's say being being more open to do something mm -hmm. to do something new, uh, I think it's about. Uh, mm, Com uh, camaraderie, maybe also camaraderie. Yeah. Camaraderie, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, here in Japan. We we also try to uh, get more engaged uh, with uh, other subsidiaries in other countries, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah, mm -hmm. to to see uh, what is happening there, and and also if they if people see that something works there, mm -hmm. they are more open to it. Yeah, um, and and to to uh, basically. Also show them that that this uh, engagement is uh, is welcome, mm -hmm. and uh, we want them to uh, them to do as much as possible for for this. Uh, that uh, um, of course to uh, to praise them is also important here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So so not not uh, should always be uh, fitting uh, to the environment or what they have achieved, but this is of course uh, also important. You've talked, about, uh, you've talked about trust a few times, how to build trust. What other things have you found helps to build trust with the Japanese team? To, um, to, to show also sometimes, and this is also something uh, which is uh, connected to, to Gemba, because I have, I have some, uh, some friends who are working only from home yeah, and don't see their team members ever. And something that is their problem is uh, the, uh, or getting difficult is that you don't have private chit chat, which is mm -hmm. of course a bit getting too much and not efficient anymore. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But this small private chit chat, be it at a coffee machine or, or somewhere else, mm -hmm. this helps also that you get emotionally nearer to your, to, to mm -hmm. your colleague. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And this is also important to create trust relationship because mm -hmm. if he tells uh, you about his weekend and about uh, what his kids were doing, he is uh, emotionally getting nearer to it, especially if you also have kids and, and also mm -hmm. do the kind of same things during the weekend. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So to show that you are uh, uh, more or less have the same, the same motivation uh, mm -hmm. as them, uh, as all the other other colleagues, uh, is is very important. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, to 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 be near to to show uh, that that you are caring and also to communicate in different ways. Mm -hmm. What about building a culture? What have you found works well to build a strong culture? I think that the team structure is important mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, there's Japanese culture, German culture, and so on. But uh, uh, every person have it, has a different character. Mm -hmm. So, and, and for a team, it's important to have also different characters in the same team uh, that that drive it. Yeah, you mm -hmm. you can have maybe a few people who are pushy, but if you have only push pushers, then uh, mm -hmm. then it's getting difficult. Uh, you need maybe person uh, more some workhorses. You need people who are creative. Yeah, mm -hmm. so the mixture of the team, depending on uh, what are you you are doing, mm -hmm. is uh, is very important. Mm -hmm. Getting some diversity in there. Probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what about if uh, you were going to give some advice to someone who's going to be sent to Japan? Okay, you go to Japan, run the organization there. They don't speak Japanese. And they don't know Japan. What advice would you give them? 
first, um, if they stay there for three years or longer, learn the language. Mm -hmm. uh, you will never be perfect, but to show your engagement is mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. uh, then if you're sent from headquarter, uh, show that you're useful. Uh, mm -hmm. So that can be that, uh, because uh, you are the, for, for the foreign, for the headquarter or wherever it is, uh, you are the ambassador of that country. Mm -hmm. So uh, you are the person who should help this, uh, the employees of this country mm -hmm. to, to get what they need from, from headquarters. Mm -hmm. On the other side also to create uh, communication channels. Mm -hmm. Not only have to be uh, this person itself, but to, for example, you have uh, some employees who are on, uh, started a few years ago, young employees who are high achievers, maybe sending them for a few months to, to headquarters in Germany or whatever to learn something mm -hmm. and uh, maybe to get some training and after some time when they come back uh, they are ready for management role. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then they have some communication channels also, mm -hmm. they have their connections, their, some relationships. Mm -hmm. and the more relationships you have here, mm -hmm. uh, the better you, you can communicate uh, with head office mm -hmm. and also you learn what ha what is the expectation from the head office. On the other side, the head office knows what is what is happening in mm -hmm. the country. What else? What else would you tell them to do? Um, yeah, team structure, diversity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to to get to know your team mm -hmm. and uh, who to trust. Mm -hmm. This is quite important. How do you work out who to trust? Because often, if you come here, you don't speak Japanese. There's bound to be someone around you who's going to be quite good in English and you can communicate with that person so you naturally gravitate to trusting that person a lot because you're depending on that person to actually have any sort of interaction with others. But often that person is probably not the most skillful or the most senior or the most important person from the Japanese team's point of view. But here you are, you're sort of you know, like a life life jacket, you're jumping onto them there. So how do you how do you work out, you know, who to trust and who's really important to develop in terms of relationships? So I, I never had this problem because You uh, speak Japanese, so you yeah, so, so uh, but of course uh, take away the language, uh, of course uh, those persons you you meet first and in the first weeks uh, and uh, I think uh, who to trust, uh, you just learn over time um, mm -hmm. to see if uh, what, you're, what you were talking with them, if, if you may be talking some, uh, about some ideas which are not, let's say, not public, yeah? if, if this is something uh, that stays within the room or not, mm -hmm. uh, um, you shouldn't go the full way first, but, but maybe to, to, uh, to see how this works. This is important, and uh, yeah, I think that it takes some time until you find out uh, who also, uh, regarding the character, regarding culture, regarding uh, uh, if this person can, can take responsibility and so on, mm -hmm. uh, is, is the person you want to spend more time with and uh, is somebody uh, you can share ideas with. So, mm -hmm. yeah, take some time. Is there anything we haven't covered yet we should talk about in terms of leading in Japan? So for, for myself, uh, I'm now in Japan for such a long time and maybe for, for a lot of, for, for you it's, it's the same, right? So yeah. I, I know that uh, the German society also changes and I come sometimes for business trips and sometimes also for private reasons I come back to, Japan, to Germany and the culture changes that I'm not sure if I ever go back to Germany, mm -hmm. if I could be happy there or not. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't see myself as somebody who is purely German or European mindset, because mm -hmm. after 18 years, uh, there's some of the Japanese mindset mm -hmm. also inside of me. Mm -hmm. Like uh, sometimes when Japanese colleagues uh, tell me, ah, this German guy is already on holiday again. Why is he taking so much holidays? And partly I can understand him. <laughs> so uh, if we're talking about uh, leading in Japan, basically my first management role was in Japan. Yeah. So I can't tell you 
how leading in Germany is now, is now especially, uh, uh, yeah. if this would work out with the management yeah. style I have right now. Yeah. It would be, maybe it would be interesting to find out, but I don't see myself back in Germany now. Mm, a bit of reverse culture shock. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. So what's your definition of, of leadership? Um, at the end, uh, if you have a team, the, the, the total of the team should be able to accomplish more than the, the individuals. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why the team structure and the diversity is so important. Mm -hmm. Well, Marco, thank you very much. It's been great finding out about your ideas on leadership. And please join us again for our next episode of Japan's top business interviews. Thank you.